Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Green Tech Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Green Tech Today, the Twit Network's Top 25 Green Tech Innovators series. This episode of Green Tech Today is brought to you by the Eco Imagination Challenge from GE. GE and its partners are awarding $200 million to ideas that help build the next generation power grid for the 21st century. For more information and to view and comment on ideas, go to ecomagination.com forward slash challenge. Electric vehicles are slowly becoming available to an ever-increasing segment of the population, but wider adoption continues to be thwarted by problems of battery life and charging convenience. Better Place in Palo Alto, California is striving to make it easier for people to own an electric car with a unique business plan that will make purchasing an EV similar to buying a cell phone. We're at Better Place in Palo Alto, California, and I'm speaking with Jason Wolf, the Vice President for North America uh, with Better Place. Jason, tell me, how is Better Place a better place? How is Better Place a better place? This company was founded on the notion that the world does need improvement. We are living in an unsustainable situation with our use of gasoline. Mm -hmm. We're burning the environment, we're impacting the economy, and we're definitely causing some major geopolitical shifts. Better Place, because it was founded on that notion, looked at how you can run an entire region or country without the usage of oil. And that is how we can make the world a better place. Okay, and so mostly getting rid of the use of oil, you're looking at switching from uh, gasoline burning cars to electric vehicles. Better Place doesn't actually make vehicles, though. What are you doing? Absolutely. So when you look at, at switching an entire country off gasoline, you have to first solve the problem of consumers that love their cars, their gasoline cars. It gets them from A to Z. And mm -hmm. in the U.S., we know how important a role the car plays. So Better Place has looked at how do you get everybody, masses, not a few early adopters, mm -hmm. from their gasoline cars to a electric car. If you look at it, there's really three key reasons why we would not all now be driving electric cars. It's not the technology. The technology existed. There was early mm -hmm. 19, uh, 20th century, 1900s, there were electric cars, there were gasoline cars. Market right. forces, economics drove gasoline to be the dominant factor. The three factors are price, so electric cars are inherently more expensive, right. mainly due to the battery, which is about a third of the price of the vehicle. Right. The second thing is they're limited in range. With my gasoline car, I've got an ecosystem of gas stations around there. I can go out, drive two miles or drive 200 miles, and yeah. the only inconvenience is one stop. Right. So if you can have affordable cars that cost the same or less than a gasoline car and unlimited range, you've solved most of the things. The third element is future-proofing. New technology people are reluctant, even if it costs the same and is as convenient, they would not adopt it if they're scared that you know, the value of the car will drop by half in two years or things like that. So you have to solve for those three things. And once you've solved for those three things, you and everybody else would say, well, you know, I'm not giving up anything, and I'm doing good to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Why not do it? Okay, so how are you solving that problem? Great. Or the three so, problems? Yeah, so, so, you, you led me right into the question. Yeah, <laughs> it's, so how do you do that? Yeah. So first of all, what you have to do is you have to realize that because all the technology exists, it's about combining pieces of technology to a complete service. Mm -hmm. We are a network and services company. We don't make the cars, we don't make the batteries. We put out infrastructure that allows convenient charging, 
it allows you to charge at home, allows you to charge at work or wherever you go. Mm -hmm. And for those extra long trips, it allows you also to switch the battery. Right. Switching the battery is kind of the secret source because if you think about the three elements I mentioned, it the hits the point there. Price, yeah. we own the battery, so it takes a third of the price off. So if you're talking about a $30,000 car mm. that's competing with a $20,000 car, suddenly it's a 20 to 20. Right. It eliminates the issue with range because we've got battery switching stations that in less than two, th three minutes, which is less time than it takes you to fill up a tank of gas, you can actually get a full new 100 mile of range. So now you right. go so in on your regular commute might be 30, 40 miles. You don't have to switch 90% of the time. But, you know, in your condition, you definitely want to go skiing in Tahoe. Absolutely. So <laughs> you're going to stop in Sa Sacramento for two, three minutes, which is pretty much what you would do with a gas tower, and you have another 100 miles of range. Right. And so it's kind of like a gas, it's, it's like a gas station, but it's a battery station. It is like a gas station, but it's a battery station, clean. And it's not like a gas station because it doesn't tether you to it every week. A gas right. station is something we do every week. Here, for most users, we would only use it every three, four, five times. But right. there are usages, like we've shown in Tokyo and we're building right now in San Francisco, taxi usages, which right. just would never be able to use electric if it wasn't switchable, because they drive 24-7. Yeah. And future-proofing, it future proofs because now if you don't own the battery as a consumer, you're not worried about the depreciation of that vehicle. You actually might see a situation like with software and electronics where your product actually keeps up with time and keeps its value for a longer time. So Which, that's how we really yeah. break down those three barriers with an entire solution that has a network operating center that communicates to all these pieces. Mm -hmm. You'll be talking to our technical people later on, and they'll give you the, exam the specifics on that. And you have the service, the customer service, that they know that they've got a strong, not only a technical solution, but also a, customer, uh, a company that stands mm -hmm. behind the service. And finally, what is really important in this is that you are now in a situation where you're similar to other industries, like in the mobile phone industry, where someone builds the phone, someone is the service provider. If I'm Verizon and I've got Nokia phones, right. the subscriber is familiar with that. They buy their phone, they have a contract for the, uh, for the services. So we buy the batteries, the energy, put in the infrastructure, and sell you miles based on how many miles you will consume a year. And so then you end up in a, the consumer ends up in a contract situation with Better Place. With Better personally. Place, they buy the car, they have a contract mm -hmm. with Better Place, and they're good to go. So uh, in terms of uh, implementation, getting it out there, we're looking at, you know, 100 years of development of gasoline car infrastructure, gas stations, like you, you called it an, an ecosystem, and it really has been developing for a century. You, how hard is it to be working against that, and where are you finding it easy to implement this strategy, and where is it really difficult and not working very well? It's a great question, and, and that's what a lot of people miss. They look at the car, they compare it to a car. Mm -hmm. But it is an ecosystem. You've got, on the oil side, you've got, they have to find the stuff. They have yeah. to transport it. People talk about safety of electric vehicles. They don't realize. We burn down highways by having tankers burn down. And we're putting 40 gallons of liquid, flammable, explodable fuel in these things. So there yeah. are challenges that the electric vehicle industry, which now seems inevitable, is going to have to grow and face. But compared to the other industry, it's, they've had 70, 80 years to develop those things. Mm -hmm. There's nothing insurmountable. It's just a question of time. Right. And what Better Place does is it accelerates that time frame by putting all the elements together. We don't do it alone. We work with utilities. We yeah. work with large corporations like GE and others to build an ecosystem that is better, cleaner, and more competitive than the gasoline vehicle is today. Okay. Now, to your second question, which I think is a very critical one, where does it happen quicker, where does it happen slower? It's pretty evident when you think about it. Places that we started, Israel, Denmark, Australia, there's a different price on the competitor, on the gasoline mm -hmm. car. So in a place like Israel, instead of paying three fifty a gallon, people are paying $8 a gallon. So right. for us, we could raise over half a billion dollars of private capital to put in markets like that 
Of course, from a geopolitical perspective, there's not that many countries that are more uh, that are going to benefit more than getting off oil than a country like Israel. Right. It's, and uh, it's, so it's basically it's, an, uh, an oil island. It's an oil <laughs> island. All around there are yeah. oil, exactly. And from a demographics perspective, it's fairly small, contained. Mm -hmm. So you can, you, it's a great place to start. Australia, which came afterwards, proved that it's not only about doing islands. You can actually put lots of islands of transportation and connect them with these switch stations which ultimately gives you endless network capability. So okay. to your question, there's countries that are, can happen quicker because of the economics, really. Yep. And there's countries like the US and Canada where prices of gasoline are really subsidized compared to what their impact is on the economy. You know, it's kind of funny, I just read that our 2010 trade balance deficit was about 450 billion in the US. The amount of gasoline we, or oil we imported, not the local, the foreign oil, was about 350. So 70% of all our trade balance issue it's is really oil. foreign oil, not even yeah. domestic oil. So it's kind of interesting that we're still subsidizing oil so much and we have yeah. alternatives. Yeah, it kind of forces us to continue down that road as long as we're subsidizing it. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you're Vice President of North America Operations. So um, looking at, say, the difference between North America and Australia, um, are you looking at Im implementing on a state-by-state -state basis here in the U.S.? Are you, are you talking with the federal government as an overarching a way to get a better place adopted here in the U.S.? How is that, how is your strategy working here? Yeah, so the rollout, the rollout is, is very actually similar to, to Australia, more than Israel. You can look at it as, because it's a network play, you've got cells, mm -hmm. you've got hubs, and you've got corridors. A cell might be the San Francisco Bay Area. It's mm -hmm. actually bigger than Israel and Denmark combined in terms <laughs> of vehicle numbers, yeah. five million vehicles in just the Bay Area. So the economics work just in that cell, and this is more like, you know, Sacramento might be a cell, this is right. more like a hub. Right. But when you connect the Bay Area with two, three switch stations to Sacramento, that starts to become a corridor, connecting I-5 down to LA. Yep. For those of you who know, two, 300 miles with another five, six switch stations, and then doing the cell, of, so you suddenly get that full network impact. Yep. There's nothing that really can stop you from doing the entire United States. It is a question, and that's why the engagement happens also in D.C. and also at the state level, because we can go as big or as small as is needed. Mm -hmm. Private capital will not fund the U.S. the same way as it will fund Europe because of it's just less attractive. But okay. private public partnerships, like we're starting to do here, do work where we share private money and capital that comes from the mm -hmm. government in loans. Very interesting uh, topic you, you brought up here is the entire U.S., if you had to kind of instigate the entire U.S., would probably cost us the equivalent of eight days, seven, eight days of oil imports, seven to eight billion dollars. That's seven, you know, we import about a billion dollars a day. Right. So it's, it's pretty staggering to think about one week's worth of oil, you can get off oil. Yeah, it's a little mind-boggling to think about the money involved and how, and how it could work. Um, are you finding, I mean, in the United States also, I'm sure that it's adoption of electric vehicles as well. Are you working with companies to help with incentives to get people to actually purchase electric vehicles? Well, the incentives are, are not coming from us. Right. The, the federal government has a $7,500 right. tax credit. They're talking about turning that a rebate. These local states, you know, I bought my Nissan Leaf standing outside Pride Ono. Uh, I'm getting $5,000 back from the state as mm -hmm. well as the federal. So there are incentives out there. Um, Better Places business model is not reliant on incentives. We have to make sure that we can, if you're buying a $20,000 gasoline vehicle, you have to be able to buy a $20,000 electric vehicle. You're paying a couple hundred dollars a month. You yep. have to be, a, so it has to be a comparative type product. Slight differences can occur. But you can't be asking beyond the first one, two percentage to the next 30, 40, 50 percent market segment for them to do such a compromise. Right. And in, in terms of strategy and what you're rolling out, um, you mentioned the taxis, the taxi fleets and how um, you've, you've already 
uh, got taxis running, uh, electric taxis working in Tokyo, and you're planning on, on implementing that in San Francisco. How's that going? That's great. That, that is really our, to date, our biggest project in the U.S. That, that will show people that this is not rocket science. This is something that can be done. In Tokyo, we've had these taxis. They've run over 10,000 miles each. They've done a couple thousand switches, zero errors. People, dignitaries and from around the world have been there and seen, driven through this thing. 59.2 seconds switch average time. So it's, it's very, very good to show people. This is a car. People have to see the solution before they can really trust it. Theory is great. So what we're doing in the Bay Area in partnership with San Jose and San Francisco, the cities, mm -hmm. and the Department of Transportation through the local transportation group who funded. So it's about a third funded by Department of Transportation, a third funded by local partners, mm -hmm. taxi companies like Yellow Cab of San Francisco, Checker Yellow in, in San Jose, City Car Share and others, are coming together as a community to show that this could be a corridor for the first time unlimited between San Francisco and San Jose, the entire South Bay re really becomes unlimited range. And uh, this is, uh, we're talking about four battery switch stations, two in San Francisco, two in San Jose, with 61 taxis, sh uh, share cars and, and limos. And it'll really give, you know, it, we calculate about two million people the opportunity, if calculate all the mm -hmm. trips yeah. to actually sit and feel what these things are. So we think it's a very relatively low cost way to educate the public, show what these things can do to the energy grid because they're connected now, these storage right. devices of batteries are connected to the grid so they can show the value long term yep. and it showcases the economics of driving electric vehicles. Yeah, and I'm sure that um, being fleet vehicles as well, getting it um, getting it implemented and applied, the, uh, the apl application of it within the cities is a little bit easier than getting individuals and trying to get people to be convinced that it would work. So altogether, it probably works as a very nice strategy. Yes, it is. So better place, where do you see yourself in five years? So as a company globally, um, things are going tremendously well. Israel and Denmark and Australia are all on track to go commercial in the next 15 months. So starting this year, end of this year, Israel is going to have paying customers and it's really mm -hmm. exciting for us. We're doing now the system-wide tests in Israel. Uh, I was just there two weeks ago, got to drive the pre-production Fluent ZEs. These, you, know, you know, you said your husband has an Audi. This is pretty much somewhere between an Audi A4 and an Audi A6. A lot of power, Great. very luxurious car at a price that's actually probably better than what the comparative gasoline car would be. But yeah. really, really good experience. The whole system's now being tested, and now we're gonna start opening that up to our fleet partners, our consumer partners to get feedback, and by the end of the year, real deliveries take place. Denmark follows, Australia follows that very shortly. So those are our three kind of early markets that are driving. Yeah. From a North America perspective, as, as we spoke about, we're engaged in Hawaii and California, U.S., okay. and in Ontario, Canada, predominantly moving ahead. We have a number of projects there on demonstrations that are going on five years out. This is a, you know, we were talking about already a company that's raised $700 million and a private company with the largest clean tech VC funding ever with $350 million last year. This company is a huge, huge operator of vehicles in, you know, I, I'm not going to guess the exact numbers, but the, the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of subscribers, that sounds like more of a telco scale operation. Yeah, yeah. sounds great. It is. It's yeah. fun. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thanks. your time. Thanks, Keith. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. All right, everybody, we'll be back in just a few minutes, so stay tuned. We're going to go check in a little bit into the technology and what they're actually doing to charge these vehicles and switch the batteries. We're partnering with uh, four of the, the biggest uh, venture capital firms in the clean energy space, three in the U.S., one in Europe. Uh, you know, again, we think that the combination of GE investment and venture capital investment is going to allow us to increase innovation. It's going to allow us to accelerate new ideas. It puts us shoulder to shoulder with some of the smartest tech investors 
and we can use the what I would call the industrial clout of GE to bring technologies to this marketplace faster. GE announced its challenge at a San Francisco event along with its four venture capital partners. Emerald Technology Ventures, Foundation Capital, Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield & Byers, and Rockport Capital Partners have all joined with GE. Ideas from companies and individuals can be entered through the Ecoimagination.com website for the next 10 weeks. So check out Ecoimagination.com. We're back. I'm talking with Aaron Platchin. He's the Product Marketing Manager at Better Place. Aaron, one of the, the things that's really struck me about implementing Better Place's strategy is maybe the difficulty of dealing with all the different kinds of vehicles that, that are on the market today. Now we've got the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Volt, the Tesla. There are all these cars. How do you, how do you deal with the differences that are, that are design differences between them? So, Amazingly, and different from other technologies like cell phones, uh, standards have actually been adopted relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. So in different regions in Europe, uh, in the US, in Japan, uh, charging standards are, are coming to the market and all the vehicles can charge from the same infrastructure. Uh, for battery switch stations, it requires uh, unique engineering uh, up front so that they're designed to have a battery that comes in and out of the car easily. Uh, but from, from a charging perspective, it's, uh, it's not a huge challenge. So they're all pretty much using the same plugs? Correct. Okay, so in terms of charging, not a big deal. So let's talk about switching stations. Um, I've seen the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Volt. The batteries are different and they're in different locations in the vehicle. How do you design a switching station that can handle those kinds of differences? So in our initial markets in Israel, uh, Denmark, and Australia where we'll have the Renault Fluence, uh, we've worked with, with the team at Renault to make a car that can work with our battery switch station. But okay. at the same time, the switch station is sort of adjustable or generic enough in nature that it can use cars of different sizes, batteries of different shapes and uh, different locations. Uh, like the, the Renault Fluence has a battery pack that's behind the rear seats. The Nissan Leaf has a battery that's underneath the car. Right. Uh, either one could work with our switch stations, but the Fluence right now is the only one that's designed to work with our initial switch stations. The, the Leaf and other cars that have a fixed battery would have to have some modifications to work. Um, but we can deal with the different types of batteries and different different car sizes and shapes. Okay, so it's not a, a huge or a significant engineering challenge in, in, in what you're it's developing. A, a few years ago, the auto industry definitely looked at battery switch as something that was maybe possible, maybe not. Right. Uh, over the last couple of years, it's, it's become understood that it's possible. It's a matter of putting in the right uh, data and energy connections mm -hmm. and latching mechanisms in the car. This can be done, but when you're making changes to car platforms, it's a significant engineering investment and it takes time. And so that's why we have a few car partners and more that we should be able to announce soon. But um, right. yeah. So you made the cell phone analogy, so I have to go to the question of, have you run into an Apple? Have you run into the company that refuses to allow you to remove the batteries and switch them? Uh, so we, we will never force a, a car <laughs> company to do it. We can't, we can't force a car company to do it. Um, but through proving that our, our technology works over the next year, uh, year or two, uh, we will have shown that within specific regions, we can have EVs that are true zero compromises driving, that you can really drive them with no long recharge time and use them as your primary car, mm -hmm. not only a secondary car. And that through proving this, we will, we will show that the world is moving in this direction and the progress in China around this is, uh, is going to be an important point too. So what, what's happening in China? Tell me uh, a bit, so bit about that. China, as a country is is looking at EVs as a as a major strategic imperative. Right. Um, they have dirty air. Um, they have a lot of people who who have no benchmark for what a car is like. So getting them to buy an electric car as their first car is actually not as hard as convincing this convincing someone to go from a gasoline car to an electric mm -hmm. car. And there are many models. I don't know three, four, or five different models and companies that are doing battery switch. And the government has come out behind it. State Grid, the largest utility right. in the world, uh, is behind it. And they have a proof of concept demonstration happening already. 
um, that's slightly different than the Better Place concept, but not very different. And we're in, we're in discussions uh, about how Better Place might play in China as well. That's really interesting. Um, for the switching station concept, can you just kind of run me through what happens? You drive your car in, how does it work? Yeah. So you're driving along, you're going on a long trip. From here, Tahoe is a pretty common long trip that would be beyond the range of an electric car. Yeah. Uh, and so your car would, would prompt you and say, uh, your destination is Tahoe, that's 200 miles away. Uh, there's a battery switch station between here and there that would that has a battery charged up for you uh, and you would it'd likely be lo located alongside the highway. Mm -hmm. You pull off the exit, drive through like you'd be going into a, a car wash. Mm -hmm. So you pull into the lane, uh, it would greet you, say, you know, nice hello Kiki. Recorded and, electronic voice. Yes. Maybe some female from England. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Could be. And uh, the, the boom will raise up, you drive over uh, just forward enough to a point where it will tell you to stop and then the floor opens beneath your car this is all automated mm -hmm. and a robot comes in your vehicle releases its battery onto a hydraulic platform that lowers it down moves that battery out of the way and in the meantime has prepared a battery from the battery inventory that's fully charged and installs it in your car and so it's robotic and they're also through sensors it recognizes who you are knows what kind of make and model of vehicle you have so it knows exactly what kind of battery to prepare and it's all automated. All automated. It's designed to work with with no people. But for the first year, we'll probably have people around just right. just to make sure. Make sure it all works. And yeah. you you already have a switching station in place in Tokyo for the taxis. And has that worked without a hitch? It's, wor it's worked more than two thousand times over six months um, without a hitch. And the cars have been driving continuously, eighteen hours a day. Um, and passengers are actually treating it like a Disneyland ride where they want to go through the battery switch station just to feel what it's like. <laughs> and the driver response has been, uh, been very encouraging. Well, I still get excited about going through a car wash, so I'd probably be just as excited I to drive through They rarely let you stay in the car these days. <laughs> this is unfortunate. Yeah, yeah well, it's, it's, it seems amazing. It, uh, the technology that you're dealing with to develop the switching stations, I mean, Better Place couldn't have happened 10, 15 years ago. I mean, everything, ha all of the technology has to have evolved together to get to this point where you could have the automated station, you can have the vehicles. and that, That's definitely true. And in particular, the in-car telematics and the, the driver user interface that makes electric vehicles right. more understandable uh, ha is key. Yeah. And that wouldn't have existed 10 years ago. And, and Better Place has its own uh, telematics or its, or its own uh, sensor and user inter interface um, uh, setup as well, doesn't yeah. it? So you've got what's f what specific, so if you've got a, say, Nissan Leaf or whatever, uh -huh. um, your car has its own proprietary user interface, but Better Place for the batteries also has an additional interface that can be accessed. Yes. So car companies have a, a driver user interface. Yes. Some of the companies that are doing the net, the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure, have their own uh, connectivity to understand what's happening with their charging network. But what's unique about Better Place is that we have we have our hands in both. We understand mm -hmm. the driver context, and we also understand the network context. And using both of those sets of data, we can come up with the optimized way to route the drivers to use the infrastructure, which is mm -hmm. the key piece and also be connected to the utility to be managing the energy that's flowing into, you know, through the infrastructure into the cars in the best way. That's interesting. So you're actually working with the utilities, being able to manage how the energy is being used. So if it's a peak hour, lots of users are charging, um, you're working with them with the charging mm -hmm. stations and also with the, uh, the switching stations for that and then also talking with the drivers and saying, you need to go four blocks to find the nearest charging station parking lot. Correct. Yeah, Interesting. That's exactly right. Very cool. Well, let's um, take a walk. I know you've got a demonstration area set up for the charging stations. Yeah. I'd love to have you show me that. So sure. let's go take a look at sure. it. Great. Thanks. So you ready for the last piece of the puzzle? We're indoors at Better Place to talk about the charging setup. Erin, um, tell me a little bit about, you've got house charging, outdoor charging, what are the different um, solutions to charging electric vehicles sure. that Better Place has been working on? So we're 
oftentimes we're known as the the battery switch company because it's something very unique that we're that we're working on. Right. Uh, but it's important for people to remember that when you're driving a, an electric car on a daily basis, the most convenient way to charge and the the way you'll do it most often is at home and at work where you park your car for long periods of time. And so in order to do so, uh, we've developed a, a whole lineup of level two charging stations. Uh, and what does level two mean? Level two it, it means the power output or the power capacity mm -hmm. of the charge spot. And okay. so these are about 240 volt 16 amps. Mm -hmm. And in the future, we'll have more variety to, to meet the needs of different environments, mm -hmm. um, like quick charge or 32 amp charging. Um, but for the, for the first generation, 16 amp 240 volt meets the needs of the cars that are coming to market now. Okay. And uh, so do you want to yeah, go just, through them? Yeah, just go through them for me. Sure. So the most common place you'll charge, and it's different in different markets because not everyone has a home garage, but in somewhere like the U.S., most people park at home. In yes. cities, people need to park along the streets or in apartment buildings. Um, but for people with dedicated parking and a garage, uh, home a home charge spot is best. Uh, it's really nice because you have a hanging cable that's permanently fixed to the charge spot. Mm -hmm. and you can leave it in your secure garage and when you come home you just take the plug and plug it in your socket of your car. Okay, and would this be, um, so similarly to the, the contract idea where you would contract with the customer for the batteries, um, would you be contracting with them for this charging spot at home, or would this be something that the consumer would be purchasing and uh, paying for the installation? Yeah, this is, when somebody signs up for a Better Place subscription, mm -hmm. they will get a charge spot installed at home. Okay. Uh, and in, depending on the subscription, they can have one at work also. Okay. Um, because if you live a certain distance from work, you park all day at work, it makes sense to, to drive to work and plug in. Okay. Great. So we have the charge spot and... Good. This is for home. Yes. We have the type that would be installed along a street in public and on a wall in public. And uh, one unique feature of these is that we have two sockets per charge spot, which cuts our costs basically in half. Hmm. Uh, instead of putting a, a charge spot per parking, parking space, space, we put one in between every two. And it's much neater for deployment, and uh, it costs a lot less. So I'm noticing here, um, this um, you were talking about standardized plugs. Mm -hmm. This is not an American. Uh, this is this plug. is the this European is standard. It's okay. commonly known as the Menekes standard. It comes from the IEC. Okay, so depending on the country, you're going to be using a different standard, or just whatever happens yeah. to be the best for the for actually implementing. Yes. Okay. Are there any um, any challenges to getting these public? charge spots actually out there to the public? Uh, number one hardest thing is just permitting. It's okay. the sa same as the hardest issue for deploying battery switch stations. Doing things in public, uh, like infrastructure projects, require mm -hmm. a lot of permitting and patience and money, and uh, that's the hardest part. The technology itself is not anything new, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that applies to across better places. The technology isn't brand new, mm -hmm. but it's the integration and system approach of this whole EV infrastructure ecosystem that, uh, that enables it to work. Right. So to, once you get the permitting, it's just a matter of getting a, a, an electrical cable off of the, tr the power trunk that's probably running down the street underneath the surface of the street. Yeah. Into and we, the and we don't line. do it ourselves. This is yeah. something that electrical contractors are very good at doing, or utilities, mm -hmm. and they'll be our partners. Okay, great. Um, is there anything else in terms of uh, the switching stations, the charging spots, anything that I've missed that, that, we, should, that we should let people know about? Uh, I mean, we could talk about it for hours, but there's, uh, I think at a high <laughs> level, we've covered most of the important things. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your time. Sure, thank you. Better Place, working to get us all off of gas, move us into a subscription model for electric power for our vehicles. Let's see if we can all make the world a better place. That's it for this episode of Green Tech Today. I'm Dr. Kiki. Find me someplace new and exciting next time. That's it for this episode of Green Tech Today. Subscribe at twit.tv forward slash GTT and never miss a show. 
If you have a question or a comment, email us at greentechtoday at twit.tv. Or you can leave a voicemail at 415-GT-TODAY. <laughs>